Good morning, church. I want to invite you to go ahead and have a seat as we start our worship service this morning. I wonder if anybody got an email from me this week. Raise your hand. All right, about a confidential meeting. Send some money to me to my private account. I could use some help. Um, yeah, you know, it, somebody reminded me that as we began this sermon series on the book of Romans that there would be some uh, spiritual attack. And it was very interesting on Wednesday night to receive many, many phone calls and emails saying, Pastor, uh, do you need some help? And I said, no, I'm just reading a book on Abraham Lincoln here and was relaxing. And, and here, here's this email sent out. Well, by, at the church, we uh, unaffectionately call this emailer uh, Bad Brett. And so if you, if you ever get an email from me about something confidential where I need some money, just please disregard it. Um, but somebody actually got a hold of, of, of an email. It's actually not my email address. It looks like mine, but it's not. And he, and he sends it under my name and quotes scripture, you know, and seems really legit. And you know what? We should probably pray for that guy. Seriously, or lady, who knows who it is, um, because that's what they spend their time doing, trying to scam our church. So um, anyways, if you did, if you did um, actually, in all sincerity, respond to that email and, and did send money to them, uh, will you let us know? We'd like to help you out. Um, so I, I'm really concerned that actually somebody did, in, in all sincerity, try to be helpful and then get scammed. So if that was you, we'd really appreciate if you'd let us know. Okay, now for those of you who are new here this week, you don't know what I'm talking about, that's okay. We're glad you're here. Um, if you're uh, here for the first time, there's a gift for you in the back. We'd really appreciate you. Um, go ahead and, and go talk to the folks back there and get to know a little bit about our church. We have a newcomer's meet and greet this afternoon at 3 o'clock. Now, um, some of you are new as of last week or this week, and I want to invite you. Uh, if, you have, uh, if you have the opportunity to come at 3 o'clock, uh, this afternoon, just come on downstairs to the fellowship hall. We'll have some food. We'll have uh, elders from the church. We'll have the staff from the church, and uh, we'll get to know each other, and it'll be a really brief time, uh, just a little over an hour, and uh, a good time to be able to um, get to know each other, get to know what this church is about, and we can just explain a little bit there. Okay, um, next Saturday is the men's breakfast. It's at 9 a.m., and I want to let you know that we're going to do something a little different with men's breakfast this year. Um, we are actually going to be doing them more often than we normally do, and we're not going to be bringing in extra speakers. We're going to be doing this as a church ourselves. And as we do this, um, I want to encourage men in the church to come. There's, there's, a, there's a certain demographic that doesn't generally come to our men's breakfast, and it's, it's typically younger men. And um, I want to encourage you, this year is going to be really something that you're not going to want to miss. If you have young kids or kids at all, if you are single, young, younger man, I really want to invite you to commit to the um, men's breakfast. What our goal is this year with men's breakfast is to train up the men of this church just specifically this year into what it means to be a man of God. As you know, men are under attack in this culture. Being masculine is under attack in this culture, and there are so many alternate views on, on what a man should be and what he should do that we feel like it's um, essential that we as men of First Baptist Church unite in our beliefs of the scriptures about what it means to be a man of God. And so we're gonna be talking about all of these things, and we're, we believe that um, as we do this that the church will change because of it. As the men change, as the men align with the word of God and, and find more specifically what God has for them as people of this church, as leaders of this church, as men who lead their families, as men who know what their role is, that this church will change. And so um, I really wanna invite you to the men's breakfast. Uh, we're gonna be doing, as I said, more often to be looking for that um, and uh, we'll talk about that more. So this, we're gonna kick this off with biblical masculinity. What is that? There's uh, all kinds of different versions of masculinity out there, but we're gonna talk about what the Bible says and try to align ourselves with it. Okay, uh, we also have a women's ministry sponsored bake sale, uh, February 11th, and uh, so people are going to be 
um, selling goods for women's ministry, specifically for re retreat scholarships. So some ladies um, could use a scholarship just to be able to go to uh, this ministry, this retreat. And so uh, you also get to get some goodies and, and uh, work on uh, the, the winter sugar um, needs that we all have. <laughs> then also, considering that, uh, we have a youth-sponsored Valentine's banquet coming up February 16th. That's at 5.30. This is a wonderful way to spend the evening. We transform this sanctuary into a banquet hall. Uh, it's a wonderful time. It helps fund kids for activities, camps, and missions trips. Um, it's $20 uh, a ticket, and you don't want to miss it. Last year, pretty much it seemed like the sanctuary was full of people. So you want to make sure that you sign up for that as soon as you can. It's a wonderful opportunity. And there's child care right here. Um, there are lots of great things happening in February. Please be sure to read your bulletin, and there is a February newsletter and letter in the lobby if you'd like to go ahead and get a hard copy of that. There are offering boxes in the foyer. Somebody told me I keep saying foyer, and I am not French, so foyer. <laughs> See, I can receive correction. <laughs> so um, we're just glad you're here. We're glad we're here to worship the Lord together and to respond to his word and to speak to the Lord as we sing uh, his many praises and glories. So I'd ask you to bow with me in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, as we turn our hearts and eyes to you, I pray that you would lead us on into true faith that is unwavering, that is a faith that remains faithful, and Lord, that you would develop in us the characteristics that you have for us, Lord, to be like Christ. Lord, we know that we woefully fall short of being like Jesus but oh, that we might be like Christ. Oh, that you would, by the power of the Holy Spirit, develop us into the character of Jesus, that we may be full of grace and truth, that we may be full of love, but we would also be discerning. I pray, Lord, that we would be unbounded in our openness to being like Jesus, that we would be unfettered, Help us, Lord, that, that we would deny ourselves and our flesh to be like Jesus, but also that the Holy Spirit would change us from the inside, that we would no longer desire the things of sin and the things of the world, and that we would see Christ as our prize, as our ultimate goal, and that we would run the race seeking Jesus at the end, and that we would jump every hurdle and make every turn, Lord, with Jesus in mind. Help us to do all things in the name of Jesus with the approval of Christ upon it, every word, every deed. And help our praise, Lord, uplift your name. Let us pray with true sincerity, but also a heart filled with thankfulness. Let our thankfulness gush out of us, Lord, so that it cannot be contained. Help us, Father, to be unreserved in our thankfulness to you. I pray for those, Lord, who are suffering today, who are struggling with whatever anguish they're dealing with, that you would give them the peace of the Holy Spirit, a peace that passes all understanding. I pray, Lord, that you would heal those that you would want to heal, and um, Lord, those of us who suffer without healing know that we have true healing in eternal life, and that is the promise. And we hold on to those promises today with a faith, Lord, that is in you and your power alone to accomplish what you have said. And we pray this in the name of Jesus, amen. Now would you please stand with me as we proclaim and agree with God's word together. This statement is the basis of our faith and let's go ahead and, and, and unify as we say it together. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Romans 5, true. What an encouraging truth today. Now, would you take a moment and encourage some other believers and others around you?
We'd ask you to return to your seats. And we're going to be singing together hymn number 267, Come Thou Almighty King. Thank you this morning, Lord, that your love is better than life. May we rest today in the truth that nothing can separate us from your great love and that blessed assurance that your sacrifice that you made on the cross for us is enough. And the church said, Amen. Amen.
You can be seated. Children can be excused for Children's Church, and I would open, uh, invite you to open up your Bibles to Romans 4, today's passage, verses 13 through 25. This is part two of Father Abraham. You could also call this series Faith First, as we continue talking about having faith um, before anything. And so let's pick up in verse 13 where we left off last week as Paul continues his argument that we must have faith before anything else. For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. That is why it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist, in hope he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations as he had been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God. Fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised, that is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. But the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Perhaps there is no greater statement of faith than the one we just read. And one thing we are learning through the book of Romans And have learned throughout the entire Bible, even as we went through the book of Genesis, we learned about Abraham and his faith, is this. That faith is everything. If we don't have faith, we won't be justified before God. Our sin will not be covered and we will not be saved. But the question remains, if that is what we need, what kind of faith do we need to be saved? After all, The demons believe in Jesus. The demons believe that the word of God is true, and they are not saved. So faith cannot just mean that we believe that the scriptures are true and that God exists. What about semi-faith? Many people have a trusting faith in God. They trust that Jesus saves, but they don't have full faith in Christ. They have faith in Jesus plus other things. But as Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that's not your own doing. It's the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. And so if faith is is faith alone and not works so that nobody can boast, then surely semi-faith, a partial faith, is not successful in saving either. No, no, it cannot be semi-faith. Is it saying we have faith? Is that sufficient? Saying that we have faith both to man and to God, is that sufficient? No, it is not. Confessing to have faith without actually having faith is an unsaving work. So we must realize that just because we've said we've had faith and we've told everybody around us, I am a Christian, does not save us. We must actually have faith. We don't just say we have faith. So if these things don't equal saving faith, what does? What does saving faith look like? And this, brothers and sisters, is perhaps the most important question you could ever ask yourself. Because if we get this wrong, we get it all wrong. And we are not saved in Christ. 
So last week, we discussed faith as coming first before works and symbols, and we discussed that works do not, cannot accompany faith. They must come after faith. And the symbols of baptism and communion, today is Communion Sunday, must come after faith. They do not have any kind of efficacious work that does anything for you to save you. And today we're going to look at the other two things, law and fulfillment. We must have faith before we obey the law and before we are fulfilling or having a fulfillment of the promises of God. So the first thing we want to look at today is faith before the law. And really we're just looking at verses 13 through 15 in this. And um, you may wonder, and this would be a great thing to, to, to discuss, is, is, is how, did, how, how is Paul saying so much about the law? And maybe you've never thought about this before. We've talked a lot about the law in the book of Romans so far. And, and perhaps that's shocking. Wow, the book of Romans, the book of faith, talks an awful lot about the law and the Jews. And I hope that you're, you're seeing this. And the reason Paul keeps doing this is because we as Christians tend to keep going back to the law. Now, one of the things that's the most obvious way people are doing this today is there's all kinds of Christian movements of people going uh, back to the law. There's a movement called theonomy where people are actually incorporating the law back into their lives as, as binding. There are all kinds of, of Jewish movements, Hebrew roots movements, where people are trying to go back to the law. We cannot seem to get away from these movements of people who see faith and grace and go, yes, I like that, but I also like the law. I need the law. And so this is very pertinent for our day and age. We need to start off our discussion of the law by saying, asking, is the law bad? And we've answered that a couple of weeks ago. No, the law is not bad. We are still called to follow the moral commands of God in the Old Testament law and the moral commands of the New Testament law, which there are many. No, the law is not bad, but we must put it in its right place, as we discussed a couple of sermons ago, that faith must come first, then we obey the moral law of God. Let's look again at verse 13 now. For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Here's what he's saying in a nutshell. Following the law, or just rule following, or following biblical principles is salvifically meaningless without faith first. Did you catch that? Following the moral law, whether it's the Old or New Testament, or just being a good person, is salvifically meaningless if you don't have faith first. Often we get the cart before the horse when it comes to salvation. And this gets really technical when people grow up in the church and they start following the morals before they actually find the faith. There's a story about the 1960s when it was very, very popular for uh, men to have uh, long hair and a young man had really long hair and the beard and everything. And, and he asked his father one day, Dad, can I drive the family car? And the dad said, get a haircut and you can drive the car. And the son replied, but dad, Jesus had long hair. And the dad replied, yeah, and Jesus walked everywhere too. <laughs> that is a pretty good snapshot of, of what happens in the church. Clean yourself up and then God will accept you. Clean yourself up, make yourself a good moral person and then you can be saved. You're, you're, you're like ready to be saved. So what, what do we oftentimes do? We invite people to church first. We invite them to church and they come and they see all these people around them living a fairly holy life. And so then they try to mimic that. And all of a sudden, they've started living by the law. They've started just trying to be a good person like the people around them not realizing that those people around them had faith first. And, and I just want to challenge you to think about this for a moment. Um, we oftentimes want to bring people to church to find the gospel, but if you read the Bible, people found the gospel before they entered the church. And that's one of the reasons why. It's so that it wouldn't confuse sanctification with justification. 
And so we got to be really careful that by bringing people to church that we're not showing them to, that they should start living a good life and completely skip over the gospel and the need for the gospel. Expecting people to clean up their lives before having saving faith actually leads them away from the gospel. You see, the law can be used. I'm not saying that the law cannot be used to reveal sin and that it's not helpful. But we must be warned that it can also keep us from the gospel if we misunderstand its purpose. So what we got to do is look at our prototype. We have to look at Abraham. How did Abraham do this? And I want to just, I want you to hear me when I say what, what verse 13 is saying. Abraham was saved before he even knew the law. Abraham did not have the law. As a matter of fact, the law did not come along until 500 years after Abraham's day. Abraham did not know the law, had not experienced the law, and yet he was saved. And that is what makes him such a great picture of faith for us. He had no law to follow. He had no Bible. He had God. And he had God giving him a promise and he believed it, and he was declared righteous. Let that sink in for a moment. Because he had faith, God made a promise to him that he and his offspring would be heirs of the world. Notice what it says. For the promise to Abraham, this is just the word of God that he believed, and his offspring, that he would be heir of the world, did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. What does it mean that that people who followed him would be made heirs of the world? What he's saying is is it's not those who follow the rules who are the heirs of the world. It's those who follow Abraham in faith that are heirs of the world. And what does it mean to be an heir of the world? Most likely it means that um, Abraham would inherit people who would have faith in God as he has as a result of faith, both Jew and Gentile. This would eventually culminate in through Abraham's seed, the coming of Jesus the Redeemer, who would die for the sins of anyone who would believe, And then Jesus would come back and rule this world, and those children who believe by faith will rule with him, and therefore they will become heirs of the world. The promise that that was given to Abraham was a people, a king, and the planet. It's a huge scope that was promised to Abraham. And how did he receive it? By faith alone. So he's our prototype. And it must come by faith alone. And then Paul in verses 14 and 15 is going to give us two reasons why faith must come before the law. Verse 14 tells us first, the reason that faith must come before the law is that the law nullifies faith. Verse 14, for it is, if it is the adherents of the law who are to be heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. Seeking to follow God by following his law requires zero faith right? You don't need to trust God if you're a good person because you've got it made. You're doing it yourself. And so following the law nullifies faith because faith is not required to follow rules. Faith is the opposite of following rules. It's saying, I can't follow the rules. I must trust in someone who can. And so it nullifies it. Then what goes on to say, where there is no law, There is no transgression. So let's go to the next one. Um, Law can only bring wrath. Notice what it says in verse 15. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. As Galatians 3.10 says, For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. So scripture is very clear. If we break the law on one point, we have broken all of it and we have become a transgressor, and it only brings condemnation. So what we see here is that both with the law nullifying faith and that the law can only bring wrath is that if salvation is through the law, then what it's saying is is that God has given us an unattainable goal and and, 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 and a false promise. In other words, if if salvation could only be through the law and we can't keep the law and there's only wrath, then we don't have a way to be saved. It's like someone promising you an arranged trip to the Bahamas, but all you have to do is provide $50 million. 
That's a false promise because you can't meet the conditions of the promise. And so if, if there is salvation in the law, if works could get you anywhere, brothers and sisters, if the law could really get you there, um, you, 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 know, you, you can't fulfill it, and so it's a false promise. And a lot of people live under this kind of problem. If we, if we believe that we can be good enough for God by following his laws and being good, then we're going to have some serious problems in our life. And I believe that a lot of Christians are trying to adhere to the Bible, fail, and live lives of perpetual self-condemnation. And many people have given up trying. When I hear people say, um, I can't meet God's standards, they're saying, I'm following the law. When they say that um, I can't live up to God's expectations, they're saying, I'm following the law. And I see so many Christians these days, or professing Christians, who give up and walk away from church and walk away from their faith because they say, I can't do this Christian thing. I'm just not good enough. Well, congratulations, you just understood the gospel. But many don't. They don't realize that they have not understood the gospel. They have succumbed to this belief that they could be good enough, that they could do enough. And they live life, a life of constant self-condemnation. They don't realize that, that the avenue of good works is a dead-end street. It goes nowhere in salvation. And trying to be good enough for God will always lead you to self-condemnation. You will always look down on yourself. You will always feel like you don't match up. And I'm asking you this morning, have you lived your life as a Christian in self-condemnation where you are beating yourself up? then can I encourage you with this? You're not living by faith. If you have any kind of self-condemnation about your salvation that you're not matching up to God's standards, it's time to have faith alone, don't you think? There's a story of a family who adopted an older child from a terrible orphanage in another country. When they brought her home, one of the things they told her was that she was expected to clean her room every day. When she heard about the, that responsibility, she fixated on it and saw it as a way she could earn her family's love. Thus, every morning when her parents came in her room, it was immaculate, and she would sit on the bed and would say, my room is clean, can I stay? Do you still love me? Her words broke her new parents' heart. Eventually, the girl learned to, uh, to hear her parents in their words as their, unconditionally, uh, as, as their unconditional love was given to this child, and that she would never be forsaken, not as she's not a visitor trying to earn her place in the family. After she knew that, she was in an inseparable part of the family. Even correction and discipline did not cause her to question her family's love for her. Perhaps you can relate. You feel like you've always got to earn a place in God's family. You've always got to find a way to be good enough, to be right enough. And brothers and sisters, I just want to encourage you, Walk away from that self-condemnation and enter into faith alone. That whenever you get to that point, go, when you say, I'm not good enough, go, exactly why Christ came. And I'm just going to receive his grace as sufficient for me and that God's love for me is unconditional because of what Christ has done. So brothers and sisters, I just want to make one last final appeal. We need to walk away from law following in order to earn God's favor. The only reason we follow the principles of Scripture is because we love Jesus and we want to glorify him. Amen? Amen. Okay. Secondly, we are called to have faith before fulfillment. There is a desire when seeking to have faith in God, and I think this is a very natural human reaction is to have fulfillment first. A lot of us want to follow the law first and then God accepts us, but a lot of us also want to see some fulfillment first. Uh, we know that in Jesus' day, Jesus was there in front of them and they said, I don't know if I believe in you. Give us a sign. Give us something, some proof. 
and then I'll believe in you. They wanted miracles. They wanted visual aids before they would have faith. You see, they wanted the evidence. They wanted the miracles before they had the faith. Now, I think that's actually quite natural, right? One of the states in our union is called the show me state. You know, show me the money first before I commit. We live our lives. Show it to me first. Give me some proof, and then I will believe. And the challenge that that Paul's about to give us is that Abraham believed before he had fulfillment. He was given a promise. He believed, and only then did he see the fulfillment of the promise. We live in an age where people want to see proof and signs and miracles before they'll have true faith. We live in an age where people just cannot trust God on his word alone. They feel that they need supernatural proof of God to cause them to trust him. And I would say that people who don't know Jesus outside the church want supernatural proof. And I would say that we're pretty fixated on supernatural proof within the church as well. For many people, seeing is believing. But let me, let me encourage you with Scripture that that is not how God brings people to himself. He did it in the New Testament at times. But at the end of the day, God gives us his word and a promise, and he expects us to have faith in that word of promise alone. That we would take him for his word alone, believe, be saved, and then see the fulfillment. And this is true of the father of faith, Abraham. Abraham had faith before fulfillment. Let's look at verse 16. That is why it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. So the promise to Abraham of redemption um, has always been based on grace, not the law. Faith is the only way to get grace, and this is the historic way of salvation. And this offer is made to anyone and everyone who would have faith. And the result of salvation by grace is that it is guaranteed by God. Notice what it says. In order that the promise may rest on grace and may be guaranteed to all of his offspring. Do you know that not only are we saved by grace and we have faith in that, but that our, our faith remains and stay steady because of God and faith in him, that we can't actually save ourselves to begin with, and we can't even keep ourselves saved. God does all of it. It's guaranteed by grace because it's not based on us. Salvation is not based on following the rules. It is based on God alone. Therefore, it is guaranteed to never fail because God does not fail. Now, Paul goes on to give four ways Abraham had faith without fulfillment. I'm going to ask you to really pay attention to this because as we, get, as we drill down now, we're going to see the essence of faith and what faith really is. Four ways Abraham had faith without fulfillment. The first was faith against the impossible. He didn't see the fulfillment of his faith. As a matter of fact, he had faith in the face of the impossible of his situation. Verse 17. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. So he was given this promise, I will have made you the father of many nations. It's interesting, that's a past tense, so it's like it 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 is going to happen, it's going to come to pass. And he believed in God, it was in his presence, and he believed that God gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that are not. So what what does Paul have in mind here? What was Abraham believing about bringing things into existence that don't exist. Well, surely, Paul had in mind Abraham and Sarah's baby, Isaac. Both father and mother were physically unable to bear children, and so that made this promise an impossibility. God said, I'm going to make you the father of many nations, but you're unable to have kids. Do you trust me? God gave him a promise in the midst of an impossibility that he could not have kids, but he's going to have a kid. But Abraham believed that God brings life from death, calls into things being which are not, and actually God did it, didn't he? God created a miracle 
when they had Isaac. And the question before us, in a similar way, is do we believe in the God of the impossible? Specifically, when we talk about bringing life from the dead and bringing the things out of existence or into existence the things that are not, we're looking specifically at the promise of resurrection. Resurrection is is the, the linchpin of the promises of God. God has promised you that when you die, that you will be resurrected bodily. You will not... You will not go to heaven just and stay as this floating spirit in heaven. You will go to what we would call the intermediate state, but there will be a resurrection, and this is the core of the Christian faith. And so when you believe in Jesus, you're believing that, you know what, your body may perish in this life, but you will be raised with a new physical and spiritual body that will last for all eternity. I don't know if that was an amen or a sneeze, but (laughs) I'll take it. In the gospel, Jesus made these promises, and one of his biggest promise was that he would raise people from the dead. If you remember the raising of Lazarus, uh, Lazarus, his friend, had died, and so Jesus makes this promise to Martha. John eleven twenty four. 24, Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again, that is her brother Lazarus, in the resurrection on the last day. So she's claiming, I have faith in the resurrection of the last day. i I, like the other Jews around me who have true faith in God, believe in the resurrection. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live. In other words, you may physically die, and all of us will unless we're raptured away, yet he shall live. That means that you will be resurrected, and everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. What what do you have to do? You have to believe. And then he asks her one of the most important questions in all Scripture. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. Right answer. And that is the challenge before every one of us. And, and why is it a challenge? Well, it's a challenge because have you ever seen anybody raised from the dead? You haven't. <laughs> Neither have I. We have a promise of something we have never seen. But God tells you to believe in it, and he's able to do it. And when you breathe your last, bed, uh, last breath, whether or not you're in the hospital bed or at home or wherever you are, you are going to die with faith that this is true. Because you have never seen it. And, 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 and in all intents and purposes, that seems impossible because we've never experienced this. This happened in the Gospels. It happened in the New Testament but it doesn't appear to be happening now. So it requires faith first and then fulfillment. Secondly, faith against hopelessness, verse 18. In hope he believed against hope. Isn't that wonderful? In hope he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations as he had been told, so shall your offspring be. When God told Abraham he would be the father of many nations, He had no natural reason to believe that this would happen. And God gave him no proof that it would happen. He just gave Abraham his word. Abraham had hope in God's promise against hope. And so what hope against hope is, is it means to believe that God can do the impossible in the face of the improbable. So I don't know what your life looks like, but there's a lot of things that God's promised you that look improbable. And Abraham's faith was a a, a faith against hopelessness, that he did not give himself into hopelessness, even though this was very improbable that this would happen. He, He went beyond that. He was able to have hope against hope. He was able to believe the things that no one else really naturally would believe. Brothers and sisters, we live in a dark times, and people have really lost faith in what they can't see. And perhaps that's infecting us a little bit, that we just don't have faith in God like maybe we used to. Maybe we don't believe he's the God who can do the impossible, and maybe we have lost some hope. I want to encourage you today to have faith alone that God can do what he said he's going to do, even if it looks pretty bleak. Which leads us to point three, his faith against doubt. Not only 
Uh, do we have to have faith against the improbable? But we have to deal with our doubts. Verse 19. He did not weaken in his faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead, since he was about 100 years old, and when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. Abraham not only had no proof of fulfillment, but he had a good reason to doubt it. He was 100 years old. His wife was 90. And you can figure it out. They're physically unable to have children. Right? They are, they are now in, in, the, in their elderly stage where both of them, it is physically impossible to have a child, to conceive. So he had good reason to doubt. No one had children at such an age. And yet, his faith did not waver. What does it say? His, he did not weaken in his faith. Isn't that amazing? No weakness in faith. No loss of faith. You know what, God? I can't even have children, but you're gonna, we're going to give us a child. Let's go. Let's do this. Now, I, I think that oftentimes we also have doubts, do we not? Now, I don't personally believe that, that doubts cropping up in our minds is a bad thing. We all have these niggling doubts. I really do believe, though, our true faith is determined on what we do with doubts. Does it grow your faith or diminish your faith? We have times where it might, we might have some doubts creep in that says, is, is this whole God thing real? Is salvation real? Are God's promises of eternal life real? We see a lot of death. We're not sure why it happens, when it happens, and how it happens. It can cause doubt. We see evil growing in the world, do we not? We see people living for everything but God. It's hard to see God out there in the culture. It's hard to see him doing things. We begin to wonder if this is really what it's cracked up to be. We begin to say, is what I read in the Bible really describing what I see in the world? Is this stuff really relevant? And faith alone presents these doubts and does not waver. You can have doubts creep up in your mind without wavering. Do you see what I'm saying? So what do you do with those doubts is the question. Do you waver or do you stand strong on Christ's word? And how are you doing on that these days? Are you wavering? I'm not sure, Lord. Or is your, is your faith actually strengthening in the midst of the doubting? That's the question for us today. And so um, faith pushes past doubts to faith in the midst of doubts, to stand strong without wavering. And that le leads us to the fourth one, and that is this, faith against hesitancy. Maybe you don't doubt. Maybe, maybe your faith is strong, but maybe um, it's hesitant. Maybe you have a hesitant faith. Let's look at verses 20 and 21. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. See, not only did Abraham not waver, he actually grew stronger in his faith as he got older. Think about that for a minute. The older he gets, the less likely the promise would be fulfilled. And yet his faith actually grew stronger as time went by. Isn't that amazing? Do you ever get to the point where you just get so hesitant to trust God with your prayers, with your future, with your commitments? Well, Abraham had less reason to trust God as he got older, but his faith actually grew when the, the fulfillment was waiting, when the fulfillment didn't happen when he had hoped it would. So how can someone grow in their faith? How can we grow in our faith as the object of our faith seems less and less certain? That's the question. You see, when faced with God's promise on one hand and the impossibility of its fulfillment on the other, Abraham chose to place every hope in God. So the, the answer is, the way to grow in faith as the uncertainty of the fulfillment of it increases is, is that you choose to be all in. In other words, you choose not to reserve. You just jump. You just leap into faith. You see, Abraham gave God his full, unreserved trust. And so as these doubts, as these the un time and unfulfillment was continuing to pile up, 
he began to, by consistently trusting God all the way, be bolstered in his faith. He had no partial doubt in the back of his mind. He gave away all of the ifs. He never said, you know, Lord, I'll follow you if you do this for me, if you do that for me. All the ifs were thrown out. All the doubts were thrown aside. He said, I will hold strong in my faith. And every time he did that, what it did was it made him depend more and more on God. Do you see? The less likely it is that God's promise is fulfilled, the more you are required to trust God alone and not have a backup plan. For Abraham, there was no backup plan. They tried with Ishmael. But then God said, it's not going to be that way. You've got to really trust in me all the way. No backup plan, no ifs. And when you choose to do that, when you have faith alone and you say, I am riding on faith alone today, that is when your faith grows. That is when you do not waver. And that is how we glorify God. You know, the scripture tells us oftentimes that the way we glorify God is we are weak. We glorify God by being weak. And what could be more weak than saying, I can't do this, God, you can. And the moment you do that and the people look around you and they go, wait, they, all they have is faith. They, they don't really have a backup plan, do they? They don't really have a fallback. God is glorified. God is glorified when he takes away all of the soldiers and it's just us. God is glorified when he takes out the legs underneath us and we trust in him still. God is glorified when we don't have a a net underneath us. God is glorified when he alone can get the glory for the fulfillment of his promise, not anything we can do. Such faith is the reason God declared Abraham righteous. That's saving faith. That's the faith that is called on for us to have. His faith was hopeful. His faith was unwavering. His faith was strong. And his faith was complete. That is saving faith. So then it goes on in verse 23 to summarize. But the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but ours also. He says, by the way, this whole story I'm telling you about Abraham and his faith, it's for you. It's for you. That you can follow in his footsteps. So we are called to have this kind of faith. Abraham's story, like all the scripture, was not just for him, it was written for us to follow. The same principle of faith applies to everyone who trusts in the Son of God. Abraham trusted God fully based on a promise alone. We must trust Christ on his promise alone. Here's the deal. None of us has seen God. None of us was there to see him crucified. None of us saw Jesus raised from the dead. We have been given the word of God. And the question is, do you believe it on his word alone? There's two things he calls us to believe in verses 24 and 25. He says, it was counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord. So first you must believe in the resurrection of Jesus. And verse 25, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Second, you must believe in his propitiation, his atoning sacrifice for your sins. You believe that he was resurrected, and you believe he was resurrected for the covering of your sins, and you have total and complete faith in that, and faith in that alone, you will be saved. One night, a house caught fire. And a young boy was forced to flee to the roof. The father stood on the ground below with outstretched arms, calling to his son, Jump, I'll catch you. He knew the boy had to jump to save his life. All the boy could see, however, was flame and smoke and blackness. As can be imagined, he was afraid to jump off the roof. His father kept yelling, Jump, I will catch you. But the boy protested, Daddy, I can't see you. The father replied, But I can see you. And that's all that matters. All the boy had to go on was his father's word. His father said, I will catch you. And he had to trust that alone. And it is what God has given each one of us. His sufficient, 
his mighty, his true and powerful word. And God's word is all we need to be saved. It's all we need to know. It is very hard to have faith alone, isn't it? That's actually really hard to believe on God's word alone, and many people will not do it. It's easier to trust in good works, actually. It's actually easier to trust in the law. It's actually easier to to go do a symbol. It's actually easier to see a miracle and get proof ahead of time. But the difficult thing is that you believe on God's word alone, and you you, you completely trust in it and it alone. So have you jumped with full faith that God will catch you because he says he will? Do you believe that there is a heaven because he says there is, that you have never seen? From a God who you've never heard but speaks you through his word, about a resurrected Savior that you have never seen or touched, have you placed all your trust in simply what God has told you about the gospel? Do you have faith that your salvation is guaranteed because he says so? I pray that your faith is full and has no ifs. For we know it's sola fide, faith alone. Sola gratia, by grace alone. Sola Christa, by Christ alone. That is how we are saved. By sola scriptura. Scripture alone. Would you bow with me in a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, we want to stand on faith alone in your word alone, on Christ alone, by grace alone. Help us, Lord, to know what that means and to be ready, Lord, to trust in you. I pray, Father, that you would um, reveal us in us our doubts and our wavering, and Lord, that we would have those things removed, and that we would once again stand alone on your word. We would once again stand alone on Christ, and we would once again stand alone on grace, all by faith alone. And I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. morning church as the first Sunday in the month this is our opportunity to gather together around the table and celebrate the Lord's Supper in 1st Corinthians chapter 11 verses 23 through 26 Paul writes to the church in Corinth concerning the Lord's Supper and this is what he says these familiar verses to us for I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The Lord's Supper is given to us by God himself as a means to bring unity within the body of Christ. Moreover, when we observe the Lord's Supper, we recognize that the table looks in three directions. It looks to the past, it looks to the present, and it looks to the future. In looking to the past, it is commemoration. The Lord's Supper refers to that last Passover meal that Jesus had with his disciples here on earth. At that time, Jesus took the bread and the cup and he passed them around, signifying that his body would be broken and that the shedding of his blood would usher in the new covenant. Therefore, the Lord's Supper helps us remember what Jesus did on the cross. And that is why it says, do this in remembrance of me, in both verse 24 and verse 25. Paul is stressing that we are always to remember the atoning sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, We are to remember how he was beaten and that he shed his blood to take away our sin. And then we look to the present and communion. The Lord's Supper speaks of the present and how we have a fellowship with a living Christ. We have communion with him now 
because our sins are forgiven. We do not have to wait for heaven to have fellowship with God. We can have that communion now. Not only do we have communion with God, but we can have communion with each other as believers. This brings unity out of division, which is precisely what was happening in Corinth when Paul wrote this letter. And finally, it looks to the future and commitment. We are, continually, we are to continually observe the Lord's Supper till he comes, verse 26. Therefore, this table also looks forward to Christ's return. It reminds us that Jesus is victorious and he will set up his kingdom here on earth and we are to proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. It also signifies the destruction of Satan when Jesus will return in victory. We won't be taking communion at that point, but we will truly be seated at the banquet table and Satan will be defeated. And as I ask the ushers to go ahead and come forward, um, please join me in prayer. Father God, we are so thankful for the Lord's Supper. Please allow it to work in us to keep us focused on the cross. Allow it to draw us into fellowship with God and with this body of believers. Instill in us the hope of the resurrection, the promise of the victory over Satan and sin, and the truth of heaven. Amen. As the ushers pass out the elements this morning, please hold on to them and we'll partake together. Um, and I would just invite you to reflect on the past and the present and the future and God's incredible love and faithfulness.
The bread and the juice that we're about to share together are a powerful symbolic proclamation, identifying with the death of Jesus Christ on the cross for helpless, hopeless sinners who needed a savior. Communion is a simple but powerful symbol of the past, the present, and the future, but communion is not where you find salvation. Communion does not save you. Communion is what you do after you find forgiveness and salvation at the cross. So let us stand firm in our faith above all else. If you take the bread with me, Jesus said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in memory of me. Take this in remembrance that Christ's body was broken for you. And in the same way, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant sealed by my blood. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Let us drink and remember that Christ's blood was shed for you. Jesus already did what you and I can never do, satisfy all of the righteous demands of a just and a holy God. Jesus already did for you and me what we cannot do for ourselves. He paid for all of our sin and guilt and to restore our broken relationship with God. And Jesus did what we cannot do for ourselves, cause us to be born again with a totally new life, to be able to walk in the spirit and stand firm in our faith. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you today standing only in our faith in Jesus Christ. We know that our faith must come before anything else because our works are nothing but filthy rags and because communion is meaningless without that foundation of faith. Father God, we are so thankful for the free gift of salvation that comes through the body and blood of your son, Jesus Christ. Help us to reflect the hope and light of salvation into this ever darkening world. And we give you all of the glory, all of the honor, and all of the praise. And we pray this in the precious name of your son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And all of God's people said, amen. Would you stand with us as we continue to worship? The blood that gives us strength from day to day will never lose its power. Amen.
Lord, even though you've saved us, we still in this life are victims and face sin. But one day with you, we will be set free from the snares of sin. Until that day, Lord, may your spirit lead us in paths of righteousness for your name's sake, with power and strength and might, that we might glorify your name and see your will done on the earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, and the church said, Amen. Amen. Daily bread.